the decisions of like why this thing is still going versus scrapping it and going with something else. Um, but uh, yeah, just short summary. It's just expensive. It's mind boggling exp- expensive. Um, I think that's the main thing. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely uh, for sure it is expensive, but I would say the bigger problem with the F 35 and we can talk about this later in the podcast mm-hmm. is it's the maintenance, you know, the, the amount of detail that you have to have with this particular aircraft yeah. is it's, it's just very detailed and just takes up a lot of resources. I mean, we can get into this later. Yeah. Well, let's, sure. uh, you mentioned Vietnam. So let's talk about some of the background a little bit more before we go into the details. Um, so McNamara was the defense secretary of the United States during a chunk of the Vietnam war and his, his kind of fighter program, or it's not really a fighter. It's sort of a multi-role aircraft like the F-35. It was the F-111. And in most defense circles, that's considered a, a pretty gigantic failure. And a lot of the critics of F-35 will point to the F-111 and say, multi-role can't work. This is the proof. Don't do it. You should have specialized airplanes and airframes for specialized tasks as opposed to what the F-35 was attempting to do, which is be a a basically take a vertical takeoff or vertical um, landing vehicle for Marines uh, have extended range for the Navy and then have stealth and all these other things that the Air Force wanted. And they're trying to shove it into one airplane. And it was really the, uh, the, the vertical landing capability, I think, that made the thing just really get difficult. Uh, but that's just my sh- you know, short analysis. But that was, um, that was compared to the F-111. So I don't know if you have any commentary on the multi-role strategy, Matt, as opposed to a, a single or more focused role uh, for different fighter airplanes. Yeah, well, let's start on the F-111. Originally, I think it started out as a, a Navy aircraft. And uh, they had had a, I can't remember the, the plane that it, it basically, you know, succeeded with it um, or sur- sur- I replaced that. Um, I, I can't remember the name of that, that one. I think the F-4 but, basically you know, took over from most of the type of things the F-111 was doing, but I could be mistaken. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you have to think about, you know, with a carrier, you basically have X amount of carrier space. And keep in mind, I mean, these planes are definitely are very maintenance intensive. And like back then, they had multiple different wings and different aircraft on those aircraft carriers. And they literally, that was before the CVNs or the carrier variant nuclear came about. Uh, so you had multiple different aircraft and, you know, they all have their own, you know, supply chain behind them. I was mostly focused on the supply chain with the F-35, you know, which, which basically, I mean, if you don't have the supply chain, you don't fly. So, you know, the F-4 or the, the F-111, you know, it was just another aircraft that you had on, on board that plane. So the air or the air force, and it's a took big up. plane, right? I mean, it's got sw- swept wings oh, it's to try huge. to you know, sh- I mean, shrink it's... it a little bit. But I mean, these things, it, when they're fully extended, they come out, you know, almost horizontally and then they kind of try to make it more, uh, straight, I guess, uh, when they pull them back for high speed, but they're, they're big planes. I mean, they're kind of a, a fighter bomber, not really a fighter. It's really just kind of a, a small bomber and you're trying to yeah, put those in aircraft definitely... carriers. That's insane. It's definitely a, a small bomber. Um, uh, definitely. Um, and keep in mind, you know, when, uh, you know, with the F 111, too, you know, a lot of your modern day or even, you know, World War II era aircraft had folding wings. You couldn't do that with the F 111. I mean, they, they came back. They, Right. So what you're what you mean is the the wings on the carriers could tilt up. F-111 could basically just swing right, yeah. forward and backwards. Yeah. That that's the difference. It swing all the way back. So, I mean, definitely you had a big footprint on board, you know, that that carrier. Plus, I mean, back then during the Vietnam War, they had like A6s, they had um 
A fours, intruders. You know, F four. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I I can get lost on the Century series aircraft. Mm-hmm. I mean, there were so many of them that you know the footprint on board those carriers. And I've been on board these carriers before. I mean, it is teeny tiny, teeny tiny. So what you're getting uh, at is if you have multiple types of aircraft on the airplane. It's not just the planes that take up space. It's all the supply chain and the support equipment and the maintenance things that are basically Absolutely. not standardized. And so if you have one plane, you would basically have one set of tools for that plane as opposed to five sets of tools taking up five times as much as space for five different aircraft or whatever the number they had. But I think that's kind of what you're getting at uh, for the carrier yeah. constraints here. You had one baggage train, you know, that's it. Um, so yeah, the F one eleven eventually got took up by the, the Air Force, and uh, I think you were also talking about uh, multi role aircraft. Uh, people like Pierre Spray, and they talk about like, ah, oh, multi role aircraft. They just suck. Like everything about them sucks. Well, I will just dis- I will totally disagree with that. Because a lot of these smaller nations, especially some of these European nations, that's really all they can afford is, I mean, they can't afford to go out there and develop or sustain, Mm -hmm. you know, like one particular type of aircraft. Like you have to have a multi-role platform. And and one of the things that uh, in researching this, I I discovered, I was looking through a lot of uh, documents from different countries about, you know, what, because like, like, like you say, I mean, the smaller countries, they really have to think hard about what programs they're going to invest in, because unlike the Pentagon that has almost a trillion dollars every year to blow on weapons platforms, I mean, you take Canada, uh, for example, they're one tenth the size in terms of population, and their defense budget is really not going into development of weapons they're basically just buying finished aircraft and so they have to decide what they're going to pick and it's a struggle and they they pointed out that today even if they wanted to they wouldn't have the resources to develop a fifth generation aircraft which is what the f-35 is Uh, it would just be too expensive there's just too many technological hurdles they'd have to invest in and you know the counterpoint to that is that sweden has its own fighter program but what the canadians were saying or observing at least was that the the Swedes basically built an airframe, but they didn't develop a lot of the technology on it. So they would basically, they called it a kit plane. They would just develop this thing uh, to fly, uh, and then they would outsource all the rest. So the missiles, the radar, whatever else that goes into this thing, uh, the engines, they would not design that. And uh, there is some of that, obviously, in Lockheed as well. They don't do the engines. It's Pratt & Whitney, I think, in F-35. The missiles, I'm sure, are done elsewhere but they might do their own radar or they they have close supervision of that um so it's just it's very difficult especially these days with uh the kind of you have to kind of try to get ahead of the competitor and invest in all this technology it just seems to get more and more expensive uh there was a couple of defense analysts calling uh this trend the death spiral the joke was by 2054 the united states will only be able to afford one airplane and it would have to be shared in the morning between the air force the afternoon with the navy uh and then it like in the on the weekends or something that the marines would get it or something it was it was kind of a joke obviously but the the trend has been these things keep getting more expensive now maybe you can explain why but just to give a statistic on this i actually mentioned this in my little book, uh, but the uh, A-4 aircraft, um, don't quiz me on when that came out, but I, I would estimate it's about 50 years ago, cost about $10 million per airplane adjusted for inflation. Uh, and then you're looking at maybe $100 million uh, or more for the F-35. And the estimates vary like crazy. So, you know, we're talking about like total um, total program Estimated flyaway costs, cost. flyaway costs, you know, over time. I mean, all these things are very nebulous and uncertain, but let's just pick, you know, $100 million for you know, ease of argument. So it's about 10 times as expensive. So do you know why that that's happened? Well, let's start with Canada. Uh, Canada, I mean, the United, well, let's start with the United States. The United States plans on buying over 2,000 uh, 35s. Guess what Canada is going to buy it's 65 aircraft 65 yeah okay 
So, like, if Canada was to go out there and just say, like, hey, we're going to create our own aircraft, we're going to invent it from scrap, and, you know, we have X amount of budget, I mean, you're, you're going to have to spread that cost, all the research and development over 65 planes. I mean, it's just, you can't do it. I mean, that would be probably a billion dollars a plane. Um, it's just not going to happen. So they're definitely reliant upon the United States. And, you know, they've, they've definitely uh, contributed with research and development of it. But, I mean, at the end of the day, they're only buying 65 planes. So it really, I mean, it, it takes a nation like the United States you know, that's going to buy a, a big lot to, when I say a lot, they, they that's an actual technical term, you know, a, a lot that they buy. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You have to buy, you know, thousands of these planes to make it cost efficient. Well, that that's certainly and, true. Um, you do have economies of scale, you know, when you have fixed costs, development costs, and then you can spread them out over multiple aircraft your per unit cost goes down obviously but the the question i'm trying to figure out and i don't really have an easy answer for it is why has the per unit cost gone up so much as opposed to back you know vietnam or whatever oh yeah well let's get back to the you know the 19 the late 1950s throughout the 1960s uh those planes that they came out with were called the century series aircraft and there were there were dozens of them. You had the F one hundred. You had the F one hundred one Voodoo. You had uh, you know the A four. I mean, I can just go, you know, plus a lot of other experimental planes that went through that. But those Century Series aircraft during that time, there was a lot of aeronautical knowledge that was gained during that time. So they might produce, let's say, the I'm just throwing something out, you know, the F-101 Voodoo. And, you know, they built it, and, you know, they, you know, this was during the Cold War. We need, uh, you know, you know, 500 of these aircraft or whatever. So they would build them, you know, and, you know, build them fast. They would have, um, you know, some test flight aircraft or whatever, and they would build them and build them fast. And then, you know, come to find out like, okay, Soviet radar is picking up on this aircraft or this thing isn't survivable anymore. So, I mean, they would quickly retire those aircraft and a lot of them still had a lot of, uh, flight time still on them. I mean, they, they could survive, you know, or they could keep on going for a long time. You still have like African nations flying that series well into the nineties, if I recall correctly. Probably. I mean, you still have a lot of third world nations that are still flying the A4, the F4. I mean, even Japan right now is still flying the F4. So, so I mean, would, they, is it fair to say it's quantity over quality? During that time, yes. Because, I mean, this is before, you know, the time of computers and some of the, you know, CAD type of uh, manufacturing and, you know, development. Yes, I mean, they were producing them quickly and trying to field them as quickly as possible to, you know, combat, you know, the Red Menace, whether that's real or not. So it was, it was, I mean, the Air Force back then and the Navy was, I mean, two or three times larger than it is today. Uh, like my grandfather, uh, you know, he grew up during the Depression. I think he was born in 1928. He you know, basically had a bachelor's degree in like, uh, elementary education and he, and the population of the United States was a lot lower back then too. So the air force back at those, those times, I mean, they were quickly, you know, take anybody that would be, you know, willing to, to fly. Yeah. I wonder if and, just the sense of urgency was stronger back then. I mean, the F 35 was developed in the nineties. The United States didn't have any real competitors in, militarily speaking. And it still kind of doesn't. I mean, it's obviously, you know, contending with China much more than it was. But I think just the complacency 
problem may have explained some of why everybody got to raise their hand and give their opinion on what they could shove into this airframe. And it may have just gotten out of hand. And also I should add that because this is a multi-nation fighter program, uh, I think that slowed down the development and increased the 